the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. And welcome. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent? Uh, it, uh, it is, uh, you're welcome to use uh, mobile devices for social media purposes, but please not to record or photograph the session of the committee. Uh, we will start this morning with the Scottish Health Council evidence session uh, and I'm ev taking evidence specifically on the Scottish Health Council's review. This is a follow-up to a session uh, from uh, before my time, in fact, from January of last year uh, when the Scottish Health Council gave evidence. So uh, I'm delighted personally for the first time to welcome to the committee uh, Pam Whittle, Chair of the Scottish Health Council, Sandra McDougall, the Acting Director of the Scottish Health Council, and Robbie Pearson, Chief Executive of Health Improvement Scotland. Uh, I wonder if I could start the session simply by asking for a little bit, perhaps with, uh, given, given, given our range of witnesses, to start first of all by uh, establishing for the record the relationship between the Scottish Health Council and Health Improvement Scotland. Yeah, I'm happy to, to go on that one, uh, Convener. The Scottish Health Council is constituted in legislation as a committee of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. It is, um, we can say a bit more about the actual committee of the Scottish Health Council, but is a, the Scottish Health Council as an entity is embedded and is accountable, accountable within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So there's an accountability line that runs from the director of the Scottish Health Council to the chair of the Scottish Health Council and uh, a line of accountability that runs from the Director of the Scottish Health Council to myself as the Chief Executive of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Yeah. That's helpful. I'm, yes, please. I'm, it, is, it acts as a governance committee um, of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and as a result of that, we have a mixed membership of, of the Council. Um, half of the membership comes from Healthcare Improvement Scotland board members, and the other half are separately appointed. But at the moment, um, Pending the outcome, final outcome of the review, we will be considering how we might broaden that wider public membership. That's helpful. In, in, in relation to our, our primary function of the Scottish Health Council in enabling uh, public participation or public influence in change within health services, is that role a scrutiny role uh, in terms of scrutinising the efforts of others or a support role or, or is it a combination of both? Convener is, is, is a blend of things. There is a scrutiny, there's a quality assurance role, there is an improvement support, there's an enabling role, and we can maybe say a little bit more about how we'd like to strengthen, particularly the enabling of capacity and capability in Scotland uh, to engage with communities. Um, as part of the review, you can say a little bit more about that if, we, if, if, if that would be helpful. Um, so we have a blend of things within the Scottish Health Council, and in some ways, Convener, I suppose it's a a microcosm of Healthcare Improvement Scotland in itself. So Healthcare Improvement Scotland having a role in quality assurance, a role in improvement support, a role in good practice and in dis dissemination of good practice and evidence. You can see all of that within, health, uh, within the Scottish Health Council itself. Um, but we may want to see a little bit more about the actual individual parts of it as the evidence session proceeds. Sure. Sandra McDougall. Yeah, um, I suppose just to say we, we've got a relatively small team within the Scottish Health Council um, that specialise in working with um, boards and more recently with health and social care partnerships in relation to service change. Uh, the vast majority of that work is about offering advice um, on good practice, um, sharing examples of experience from other areas, sometimes offering a bit of training and capacity building to staff within these bodies. Um, in, a, in a small number of changes uh, that are identified as major change, the Scottish Health Council has a quality assurance role. Um, and that means that um, we work very closely with um, the NHS boards uh, throughout that process. Uh, the boards are required to carry out a minimum of three months uh, consultation. And we have a role in making sure that they um, follow the requirements and the, the guidance, the cell 4 2010 guidance, um, and producing um, a report at the end of that process. So our report um, goes to the board to help inform its decision making before any proposals would then go forward to the cabinet secretary. We try and do three things um, in the reports. We um, 
first of all, set out the process that the board has followed and how that has complied with the guidance. Uh, the other thing that we seek to do is to provide a bit of an independent summary of any views and concerns that might have been expressed by communities uh, throughout these processes. Um, and the third thing is that we look at, we think about recommendations for the board in terms of moving forward, things that we think it should do in terms of next steps in, in relation to the particular change, but also perhaps areas where we think that they could learn for the future. Thank you very much. Do you, do you, how far do any of the witnesses feel mm. that the function and the role that you've described of the Scottish Health Council is clear to the general public? Um, can I give a bit of feedback from the actual consultation that we undertook? So there is not as great a clarity as there could be about the role of the Scottish Health Council. And in some ways, convener, it would be fair to say the name gets in the way as well. Um, but in the broader um, opportunity that we have within Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the work that we're doing to explain the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, indeed evidence to this committee in the past around the Improvement Hub is a good demonstration of the work we do within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So we have work to do it would be fair to say to make sure people understand the role of the Scottish Health Council within the broader um, responsibilities of Health Improvement Scotland. But equally, there's a role for us to ensure that the Scottish Health Council is fit for purpose in a different landscape. So if you go back to when the Scottish Health Council was constituted in 2005, there were 15 territorial health boards that was a principal relationship. We're now in an environment which is more diverse. We have around 70 different bodies that we have to engage with, from local authorities, um, territorial boards, integration authorities, um, and that's putting aside where we are in respect of the voluntary sector as well. So there's work to be done in defining very clearly the role, the contribution of the Scottish Health Council within the broader uh, strategy of healthcare improvement in Scotland. Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, thanks, Convener, and good morning, panel. I just wanted to explore that a wee bit further, and I think, um, Sandra, you've kind of laid out, I think it's, it's fairly clear in my mind, the, the two things you're trying to do here and the three kind of outputs from that. Um, so I suppose I just wanted some clarity in, in the paper you've submitted. You're talking about um, having, a, um, having to refocus and maybe going in a different direction and changing what you're doing. So I'm just trying to understand what it is you think about what you've described you're doing at the moment is that you should or shouldn't be doing and what extra you should or shouldn't be doing in that context. Do you mean specifically in relation to the service change work that we do or more generally? Well, in terms of what you've written here, it says Health Improvement Scotland believes a refocus Scottish Health Council. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're saying that th th there's changes you're going to have to, to look at making in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. So what is it you're, you, you, you think you need to change? We need to change. Well, um, I suppose health and social care integration has, has been sure. um, really important for, mm -hmm. for people using services for communities across Scotland. It's changed over the last couple of years, the, the, the way that we have worked. So we don't have a formal role to work with the integration authorities. Our role was, a statutory role is about working with the NHS mm -hmm. boards. Um, but in light of integration and what that means for communities, we've already started to adjust the ways that we work in light of things like the Our Voice framework as well, which was about strengthening people's voices across health and social care services. So we, we've been doing that gradually over the last few years. We've been doing more work directly with communities. We've been offering advice on service change to um, health and social care partnerships uh, informally. Um, and this was an opportunity really for us to, to step back and reflect on how the landscape has changed and how we might have to change to adjust and accommodate that. Um, we recognise that this means working with Bod with a number of different bodies. It means working in, in different ways. Uh, there are other bodies that have got a, a real interest in this, and we want to make sure that our work is focused in areas where um, it will make the biggest impact. Um, and that was really the, the, the hmm. purpose. Now, I, mean, I understand the, the thing about your yeah, landscape's changed, so you need to look at social care as well as health, and that, that's kind of clear. But that'd be doing what you're doing and just ex expanding it to work with different different bodies. I suppose it's the bit here we've got quoted in our papers from, from Pam Whittle, which says there are undoubtedly tensions between different aspects of the current role acting as um, call it assurance and an emerging call to move to become an independent feedback body. I'm not quite sure where that's going. I think, um, I think 
the, the whole issue of independence is quite difficult when you, it's from a, an organization which sits within an organization, but we do actually speak for, as an independent, um, mm -hmm. as an independent voice. And, and I think it's that um, which we have become more assertive in trying to make sure that our view is, is clearer um, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but, to the, uh, but nevertheless, um, it, is, it, is, it is a complex picture. Um, and so you think you're not independent? Because at the end of the day, it's a health board you're advising and it's a health board you're monitoring. Do you think you're not independent in the health oh, yeah. boards? Well, we are independent. Exactly, so I don't Absolutely. understand why you think there's tension. <laughs> I think it's it's a perceived it's a perceived um, a lack of independence. I think from certain people who think that we uh, who have thought in the past. So it's just us about being clearer. About so it's a communication it issue. It is about communication. Rather than fundamentally changing Correct. anything. You're... I think that's absolutely right. right. It is about communicating what we are about. Okay. And I think that was something that became quite clear in the progression of the of the review, the initial mm -hmm. um, review and the subsequent review, that it wasn't clear uh, to everybody exactly right. what our role was. Okay, so what you're talking about isn't changing the remit or the direction no. or what you're doing or the way you're doing it. It's, it's about how you communicate that to make it clearer yeah. well, to what's going on. You wanted to come in. Yeah. Can I just pick up one of the points in terms of what would be different about the Scottish Health Council as we evolve over the next couple of years? So, for instance, the relationship, the primary relationship between the Scottish Health Council and the territorial boards is through our local offices yeah, around the country. And that's a really important working relationship at the front line of services out there in Scotland. Now, one of the other things I'd like to see the Scottish Health Council do, though, beyond the local uh, contribution, is to give more of a voice to the bigger national issues facing Scotland. So this committee has spent a lot of time looking at the, the quality of care offered to children and adolescents in Scotland. Now, the Scottish Health Council could have a role in giving an overall thematic review of how easy was it <coughs> excuse me, for individuals to access, for their families, for children and young people to access child and adolescent mental health services from the, from the, from the user perspective. And so I'd like to see more of that evolve for us as a Scottish Health Council into the future. OK, okay uh, thanks for that. I've got a very practical question to finish up with that um, you may be able to help uh, comment on. Um, in my area, in the East End of Glasgow, um, we had the situation with the Lightburn site, and that's thankfully put behind us now. And I've met with the health board round about where we go forward, what goes on that site, what goes on other sites, what they do with services around the area. Um, and as part of that, I've got an intention, along with other elected members, to go out and talk to community groups on our own behalf um, and get some comments, feedback, etc., to then take to the health board and say, this is what we see in the community. Um, so that kind of engagement process, if you like, but outside something the health board's doing directly. Is that something that you would perhaps be willing to engage with and support us in doing? Yeah, I I, I, absolutely. So what I would say um, is that one of the discussions we've had in the previous meeting of this committee is um, the concern within some arbitrary be position between major and all service change. Hmm. What we want to be in a position is enabling, whether it's NHS boards or integration authorities, um, to do the very best in engaging with their communities and providing the tools, providing the expertise, and that is very much akin to the resource nationally we are providing for improvement support through our improvement hub. So I'd like to see more of that being taken forward on behalf through the Scottish Health Council, but engaging and supporting those bodies that are responsible for engaging with the communities, but doing it in a consistent, high-quality way. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I want to touch on integration boards. Uh, and you mentioned, I think it was uh, Sandra mentioned, about giving advice informally, uh, basically. And you met, you know, to the Convener at the beginning, it's still not very clear exactly what you do to the general public and to me as well, actually, who, who you're accountable to and the legislation you have. But sticking to, to the intergenerational social care and health, uh, basically. Do you think that your role should be extended to include that? Would it need legislative change for, for yourselves, to, for the role of the body, to be able to actually work with the integration boards? You mentioned you give advice, but you don't have any legislative clout, as you might call it there. So would you be looking, or do you think legislation needs to change so that you can actually do a job with the health integration that's coming about? 
So the position is the Healthcare Improvement Scotland, which the Scottish Health Council is a constituent part, is already engaging with integration authorities. Improvement support um, is a good example around strategic planning, strategic commissioning of services. Um, the work that we already do with the care inspectorate in the, the joint inspection of adult services, and we just published a report, for instance, into North Lanarkshire. So um, <clears throat> I don't believe this is a legislative thing. This is about how we work with a broad range of stakeholders. It includes the care inspectorate, it includes the alliance, it includes COSLA, it includes a whole diverse range of voluntary groups. Because within the resources we've got within the Scottish Health Council, we cannot possibly do everything. So it's about how we deploy the expertise and skills that we've got with other agencies to support and enabling greater participation and engagement of citizens in the design of their health and social care services. So I don't believe it's a legislative thing. I think it's important that we can work across organisational boundaries in a way which ultimately delivers better outcomes. That must be the objective. Okay. So you don't believe you need legislative change. You're already working with we the integration with boards. Yes. You mentioned in the fact that uh, the groups that are, you engage with, at the very end you mentioned public, uh, and that is the most important thing about Correct. changes. Yes. Uh, how do you expect to expand your role working with the public to ensure that they are consulted, they know what the integration is? So there's two parts to it. Um, Sandra might want to say a bit about the National Citizens Panel, but it's really important in engaging with people at a local level, and we'll say a bit more about that, but can we hear if Sandra wants to say a bit about engaging with people? Yeah, um, so there's, I suppose there's a number of different ways that we, we look to, to do that. Um, engaging people on, on national issues is something that we do through um, our citizen panel being one mechanism for doing that. Um, we also use our local offices and their networks to sometimes gather views from people about a number of different issues. I think you may have some examples of that in, in the, the, the written submission. Um, the citizen panel was set up partly because of a perceived gap in how do you get the voice of the general public or the Scottish population into health and social care issues um, rather than, than people who have a, a particular interest who, who might already be um, involved and engaged. So the, the panel was set up, um, it was re recruited uh, from people across Scotland. Uh, there's a whole um, report which sets out the kind of rationale and the thinking as to why um, we recruited in, in the way that, that we did. Um, we went through the electoral register, we did some on-street recruitment, we did targeted recruitment and we, the idea was to get a profile that was broadly representative of the Scottish population. Um, we, we've been quite successful in that. There are one or two categories where it was a bit trickier mm -hmm. to get that, that balance. Um, and we have, over the last year, tested uh, working with the panel through, primarily through surveys. Um, and we, we've asked uh, a number of questions, some of which um, have come from um, Scottish Government and policies that they're working on. Um, some have come from other organisations, third sector organisations. Um, we produce and, and publish the reports and what we are really keen to do is to see that, that those reports have an impact. So we, we go back to the panel members with the write-up of the, the findings so they can see what's emerging from that. Um, but we also follow up with the people who have, have um, an interest in the questions and taking those forward to see what difference uh, that will make and, and so that we can feed back to panel members and how those views have been used. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a way of us um, engaging with the broader public. Can I just come in that one? I know one of my colleagues is, is going to ask in regards to the consultation process and how many you know, replies you, you had back. So I, w I won't go on in that one, but you've got the citizens panel. Um, consulta consultation is hopefully sometimes should be uh, done by the health board. Uh, with the local people who are affected by it. So I just wonder, and I don't mean this in a bad way, uh, but, but basically, do you think there's still a role for the Scottish Health Council? Because what you've said, not just to me, but to others as well, is the fact that um, you give advice informally in regard to integration, that's what you said, uh, and obviously that's a huge big issue. Um, do you speak to the health board? Do you see if consultations have, have went out? Uh, but I mean, that's statutory, they must you know, 
do consultations, although unfortunately, like I've Mickey, I had the same situation in Glasgow with a minor injuries unit where we had to push them to go forward in a consultation. So I wonder what the role of you know, is. Do you think there still is a use? And ha have you spoke to the Scottish Government about it? Um, I mean, in, in terms of uh, the work that we do around service change, which I think is, is what you're, you're focusing on, um, clearly there is, there is still an a, a agenda around service change in terms of the 2020 vision and, and how um, we make changes to primary care services, for example. So it's really important that people in communities are engaged in co-producing these, these changes right from uh, the very outset. So there's a num the, the, the ways in which we seek to add value to that process is um, in the, the vast majority of cases, it's about offering advice and, and good practice to boards, giving examples about what has worked um, elsewhere, using our local knowledge and, and intelligence to suggest perhaps groups um, that might not have had an opportunity or might not be um, on the radar of, of um, the health boards or the integration authorities to try and make sure that as many people as possible have a say. Um, sometimes that's also about doing a bit of capacity building I'm with sorry the to boards. Interrupt. Is that when you say groups that haven't had a say, is this local communities? Yes. Is this patients yes. groups? Yes. yes. Because these are the people who are the most vulnerable and don't yes. tend to get a say. Uh, I'm not going to get into you know, how many people have replied from you in that group, because I know it's going to be asked before, but that would be your purpose, is mm -hmm. to get the hard to reach people to come to, yes. come to you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in the case of, of major change, the changes that are, are generally regarded as being the most contentious changes, mm -hmm. um, I suppose the, the value in our uh, report is that we are providing an independent commentary, um, hopefully some independent assurance about how the process has been followed, and also an independent summary of, of the views and concerns that have been expressed by communities and where we think the learning is. So we hope that that's of value in terms of informing the decision-making process. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, convener. So in light of the major questions that have arisen from the review, you know, regarding the, the Council's existence and its role, can you tell me what material actions and decisions have resulted from that lengthy review? Okay, <clears throat> if I can go first. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we've received that and we, now need, and we are considering it. We've, over the past two months, been taking very much the output from that. If I could say there are four or five big things that we'd want to do on the back of this review. So firstly, it's about respecting the fact we're no longer in a position of 15, as it was in 2005, territorial boards. There's a completely different landscape out there in health and social care. I won't dwell on that any longer, but we do need to adjust to that. The second thing I'd say is that people are looking for us to influence and inform policy at a national level. So I touched on children and adolescents in, in Scotland and how they access services. We know that um, half of adults in Scotland who have a mental health condition um, acquired that condition before the age of 14. So there's an important role for us is Scottish Health Council, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, uh, informing the design of services and informing best participation and practice in accessing child and adolescent mental health services. Now that's one example where I'd like us to adopt more of a national thematic approach. The third area that um, has been identified from the consultation is there's lots of good practice out there. There's lots of evidence, there's lots of toolkits about participation and engagement, but it's pretty patchy as to how it's actually implemented. So we've got a greater role in not only quality assuring, but also giving the tools and enabling the capability to happen in a more consistent way. The other area which um, has come out of the consultation is around service change and absolutely need for clarity in respect of the role of the Scottish Health Council in that more integrated landscape. And we can see a bit more about our thinking on how we actually convey that. Um, so those are four big themes um, emerging from it. Now, one of the, the, the other messages is a very positive message about the contribution of all our staff in the Scottish Health Council at a local level. And the relationships are built up in a supportive way to NHS boards over the past um, 12 years or so. Now, we also recognise there's a need to enhance the capability and expertise to allow um, 
greater uh, involvement in the design of um, effective participation. Now, that requires an enhancing of our skills and resources within the Scottish Health Council, building on that local presence that we have. Now, those are resourcing issues, and we need to think about how we do that best. But those are four or five, hopefully, uh, that gives you a flavour of some of the key messages emerging and how we are anticipating responding. So you say it's, it's how you're anticipating responding, but I mean, I, I took a note of what you were saying, and they seem, they seem to be more that you've identified that these are areas where you might need to change, but they haven't necessarily explained how you will change or how you will um, take action on that. So, for instance, you said, you know, you think you'd like to influence policy, but you haven't exactly said how you would how you would follow that through. You said that you think you need to adjust to the different landscape of the health boards, but you haven't said exactly how you will do it. Can you, can you enlighten me a little so, bit more on that? So this will be a transition and a journey. Um, now, the, the Scottish Health Council has been in existence since 2005. This won't be a, a flick of a switch to achieve all those things. There will be things about resourcing, there's things about the workforce, there's things about skills, um, but it's also something about how we work with a range of partners in delivering it. Now, we've had good working relationships with the Care Inspectorate, with the Alliance, with COSLA, mm -hmm. and it's important that we build on that and taking this forward. So this will be a two to three year journey. On the specific point about the thematics, what I mean is that Scottish Health Council, Health Care Improvement Scotland, would publish in future a report about access to child and adolescent mental health services, for instance, and about how individuals, whether it's young people, other families, their mums and their dads, and how they were able to access those services and how easy it was and what the difficulties and what the challenges were and how we can better inform more effective participation in that example. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I, I suppose just to maybe describe to you a bit about how things have worked and, and just how that might change for our staff on a, on a day to day basis. Um, we have um, lots of requests coming come to us as an organisation locally and, and nationally for support and to get involved in a range of, of, of different things, to provide advice to perhaps somebody that's, that's reviewing a service, uh, to provide training, etc. So we've got multiple uh, projects, multiple pieces of activity going on across um, all of our work. What we think we need to do is to try and focus in on areas where actually we can make a, a bigger collective impact so that we join up some of the work <coughs> that, are, that might be happening locally with our um, evidence function at a national level, with our volunteering programme and thinking about where the role for volunteers might be in a particular activity. So what we really want to move to in future is a system where rather than responding um, you know, to all of these different demands on us that we're engaging with our stakeholders and we're looking at where are the, the areas, um, the priorities for services where our collective efforts might make the biggest difference. So that's what we mean by shifting to that more thematic way of working um, and doing that in a way that's more about collaborating with our stakeholders to make sure that, that we're avoiding duplication, that we're adding value and that we're able to demonstrate uh, distinct impact but that, that we are looking for opportunities to collaborate with others where our collective efforts um, might add uh, the biggest benefit. So I, I, hope, I hope that helps um, and, and just in terms of articulating what, what that shift might look like for our staff and, and what we're delivering each year. Uh, could I, could I oh, add a little bit? I think one of the interesting developments over the last year was we, um, I established a, uh, a programme board for the uh, for for taking forward some of the aspects of our voice that, um, that the um, Scottish Health Council is responsible for. And as a result of that, that has brought other people into play in, in a much closer partnership um, approach, which I think has actually demonstrated how we're moving forward um, in, in, in jointly with the Alliance and with COSLA. And I think it's been very positive and I think we want to build on that type of uh, partnership approach, but on a bigger scale. What, what's the implication then, if you go to a more national model or way of working, what is the implication for the local engagement, which other colleagues have asked about already? So what is crucial is we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in here. These local relationships and those local offices and that relationship at that local level is absolutely important. Um, what we do need to do, though, is think about in the context of um, uh, 31 integration authorities, 
32 local authorities, three emergent regions, and start to think about how we evolve our relationships that go beyond where we've traditionally been on that spine of 14 territorial boards. Now, that will require a different um, thinking about resources and people and how we use our people to best effect within that. But we have a budget of around £2.7 million. Pounds. We've got over 60 people. Um, we've got some extremely experienced people in what they've done and the relationships they've built. So we just need to be careful that we don't move from something that's a centralisation. That is not what we're yes. about here, where it's about that balance between local identity, local presence, and where we can, at appropriately at a national level, add value by doing bigger national things. But there are choices and priorities to be made within that. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. I wanted to really look at how, and get both Sandra uh, White's question and Ashton Demon's question, how that's actually going to happen in practice. Because if you're looking back at the last meeting, there was a quote which um, our former convener read out to you. It was from a constituent of mine which said that she believed that the SHC is a toothless beast with absolutely no power to enforce recommendations. Now, how do you think your review is going to actually change that for patients who are trying to put their faith in you as an organisation to speak on their behalf when major service changes take place? And actually, is it time we looked at whether or not there's more of an independent role for you? OK, so in Healthcare Improvement Scotland, it would be fair to say we don't pull our punches when we do our scrutiny work. Um, we're very direct in how we convey uh, some tough messages. There are some points of learning and reflection that we want to take from the service change process that we think can um, enhance our contribution from our participation and engagement perspective. And I'd like uh, Sandra may wish to refer to that. Yeah, um, I, think it's, I think it's a good question. We realise that... Um, Major changes are, are, are areas where people feel really passionately about. We, we know that people these can be quite lengthy, protracted processes, um, and there are people who invest a lot of time and effort because they really care about the services that are being considered. Um, what we have in common with, with those um, people is that we want to make sure that their voices are being listened to uh, and, and that that's evident in the decision-making process uh, by NHS boards. Um, and I think I've alluded to the fact that our reports, as well as looking at the process for engagement, seek to provide an independent commentary on the views and concerns that have been expressed by communities and recommendations. Um, and we, we speak to communities directly through these processes. If there are campaign groups that are established, we're keen to, to, to make sure that we understand and reflect their views in our reports. Um, but our report is produced prior to the board decision making and, and we send that to the board for them to take account of. One of the suggestions that I think was really interesting and one of the consultation responses that, that was received was um, whether boards could do more to perhaps more formally respond to our reports and recommendations. Um, I think that's something that we would welcome. I think that would probably be welcomed by um, the, the communities who take part in these processes um, because it would enable, I suppose, a, 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 a clear articulation of, um, you know, how the boards are, are taking into account people's views. And that might not necessarily mean that the board agrees with the, the views and, and concerns of, of people who've been involved, but um, they, they need to be able to respond to them and explain you know, if they're proposing something that's at odds with what communities want, what the rationale is for that. So I think that bit of the process is really important, getting that bit right. I think, you know, to really get to the nub of this was looking back at 2002, Nicola Sturgeon, when she was a member of the Health and Sport Committee, she said that people feel that consultation processes are a sham and health boards go through the motions and then do what they want regardless. And I think that's, that really sums up where I think we've been concerned, that actually your recommendations are just that, recommendations, and health boards can ignore them and do ignore them. But it's actually... You know, the sort of, when you're running a campaign, using you as an organisation to actually stand up is really important, I think, for people out there. And that's where I think, um, from not what I've heard, how you think that really has to change to so actually make sure that your recommendations, maybe not to uh, go forward with service change, are actually heeded by health boards, not just considered. So our role in, in respect to the Scottish Health Council is to quality assure, when it comes to major service change, the level of engagement and the quality of that engagement and the voice has been heard. 
our role is not to, um, I guess, provide a commentary in the overall shape of the clinical model that is being, for instance, um, advanced. But what Sandra has described is a, a process which would be more transparent about how the board has responded to recommendations um, that we are making in, in the context of a quality assurance around participation. And that would be very similar to um, the role that we already have in Healthcare Improvement in Scotland from a scrutiny standpoint about recommendations and requirements on NHS boards. So there would be a level of transparency here in responsiveness of NHS boards. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, my question stems from Mars Briggs and touches on uh, some of the granular detail that we've uh, covered lightly in this session so far, and that's about service redesign. And obviously, one of the functions of the Health Council is to um, consult around major service redesign. Um, but we discussed this, I think, last year as well to a certain degree. Can you remind the committee the process by which um, a service redesign is designated as either major or minor, and in the case of a minor service redesign, what your mandate is in terms of consultation of the public? I think that's over to you, Sandra. Uh, yeah. Um, so the the process is, is determined, it's set out in the cell for 2010 guidance for, for NHS boards. Um, so there's a, a requirement on, on boards to consider whether a service change should be major and if, if they, they think it may be to seek advice from um, the Scottish Government about that. Um, now, in, in doing that, um, in approaching the Scottish Government, they're required to take account of the guidance on identifying major change, which sets out, I think, nine different factors um, around change, things like what's the impact on, on patients, so how many patients are likely to be affected by a change, does it involve a relocation or centralisation of, of services, does it involve unscheduled um, or emergency care, um, is, is there public concern about the, the proposal so far based on, on the engagement that's taken place? What's the impact on other services likely to be? Is there a history here around this, this service? So it's th that guidance is really about making sure that there's, there's full and comprehensive consideration of, of what a change is, is like. So the board um, should consider that guidance and reach its own view about whether a change is major or not, and then should then approach the Scottish Government. But when they do that, um, it's, it's become custom and, and practice, really, for them to ask for our view to include that um, when they make their approach to the Scottish Government. So we then offer a view. We take into account the board's considerations. We take into account our own knowledge and understanding about the process and the concerns that have been expressed so far. We also look at the, the sort of precedent around it. So we look at have there been any other similar changes that have been considered in the past and were, were they considered um, to be to be major change or not. Um, so all of that then goes to the Scottish Government and ultimately it's the Scottish Government that makes a decision on whether a, a change is major or not. Um, we, we think it's probably unfortunate that, that, that it's become... Um, you know, perceived as being this very two-tier approach about major versus non-major, because from our perspective, wh wherever a decision is being made, it's really important that that guidance, the process is clear, that people are involved right from, from the outset in helping to shape um, the change. Uh, but but we, we appreciate that that status of, of it being a major change has become very important for some communities. Service redesign. If the government designates something as a minor service change, do you have any role to consult uh, affected communities about that? So, so we don't we don't have a role to consult communities. The role in terms of consulting communities um, sits with NHS right. boards. Our role when it's a major change is to provide a quality assurance report about how they've done that and we speak directly to communities to inform our, our view. When it's not a major change, uh, we still have an advisory role um, to, to advise on what, what changes might be, what, what engagement might be proportionate um, and we do the, the sort of sharing of practice from, from other areas about things that, that we think uh, boards should take um, into account when planning changes. So we would still be um, encouraging boards to make sure that, that their communities are having every chance to, to give their views on, on, on these processes, um, being involved right, right from the outset and that, that they should also be taking 
taking those things into account, but we don't have a formal role in terms of any sort of quality assurance of, of non-major change. Just one very, very brief supplemental. Yeah. Um, given that any service change um, can be very emotive for the patients it affects, um, the subjective application of that guidance can be quite troublesome, I think. And, and it worries me that the Scottish Government is the final arbiter of that, and particularly when it's facing negative public scrutiny about proposed service redesign. Would you agree that perhaps that should be taken away from the Scottish Government and the uh, designation of whether it's major or minor should actually perhaps rest with yourselves or another third party body? I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment as to whether a change at that level should be taken away from ministers. Ultimately, it's um, the National Health Services and the accountability of ministers is to this parliament and about major service change, and it should remain with ministers. I'm not here to comment on that. I think what is important, though, for the Scottish Health Council is that whatever the nature of the change is that we are there ensuring this best practice, there's effective participation in that. And I think I take very much the point um, uh, that's made that whatever it is, whether it's major or less than major, it matters to those communities. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, panel. I just wanted to follow on from um, uh, Miles Briggs's question. When he's, you know, he's suggesting that uh, HIS uh, reviews and HSC reviews are indeed recommendations and there's no compunction to take these recommendations forward. And I wondered... Who is, who is actually uh, um, uh, have, a, have an overview of, of the implementation of these recommendations? Because it seems to me, as you know, you and I both know, uh, the one I'm talking about, uh, Robbie, that, that, that in an HIS review in 2017, it was almost identical to the one that came out in 2012, the recommendations that came forward that hadn't, hadn't been implemented. So should, we, should, we, should they be policed by yourself? Uh, and should that effectiveness of these implementations uh, or recommendations be published? Because at the moment, to me, boards are, are self-reporting uh, against these recommendations. So should AHAS and HSE have a bigger independent role uh, in, in policing that, that change? I, I think it's an important point, um, convener. And um, what I would like to see, and it's picked up the point that Sandra made, is the transparency around the recommendations that arise from major service change. Um, ensuring that NHS boards don't just add it into the business case and off it goes. Mm. There is something about ensuring there's a closure of a loop here and when there are concerns, whether it's about communities' access to transport or um, the distribution of a service that is maybe moving in a different way, then the, those voices are heard and um, there's an active feedback loop from the, cons from the issues raised and the recommendations from our work. Um, and I think it's an important part of the role of healthcare improvement in Scotland what is important is the patients at the centre of our work and the voice of citizens in accessing services, whether it's health and social care services, needs to be absolutely to the fore. Um, so there's a transparency point ensuring that NHS boards are responding to recommendations um, in a very clear way and in a meaningful way, and it isn't about tokenism. In that case, then, who, who's, who's reviewing those the implementation of those recommendations? Who's reviewing them and who's publishing them? How, do you, how are you going to make that more transparent? So, from what Sandra's described, is it was a process whereby we can actually make recommendations on the basis of a process of engagement and participation, which may have been good, it may have been suboptimal, it may have been poor, but we make recommendations. What we need to ensure is the NHS board responds visibly and publicly to those recommendations in the future. And I think that would be a good step forward in terms of transparency and building uh, a more effective system of responsiveness amongst NHS boards. So, uh, that, so, so just very, uh, very quickly, Brian. So, so to, to implement that, do you need, does HIS need uh, more legislative power to, to I don't be able believe to do we that? need more legislative power. Okay. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in. Um, what's been done differently in the past year from the previous report to engage locally because you've got just looking at the Scottish Health Council's website there's documents and documents and documents that would take me days to go through and they're all excellent but you know I've been a nurse for 30 years and I didn't know the Health Council existed until joining this committee and I've spoke to former colleagues as well that would be happy to engage so I guess, the, so the question is, what have you been doing differently? Because sometimes I find that social media action groups are how the local people are informed instead of 
boards may be communicating more effectively. So can the Scottish Health Council uh, support boards to engage uh, with local people? I think that's our prime, uh, uh, a key part of our role is to support boards um, and to encourage them to do more. Um, some of them are, are moving forward differently. Methods of communication are changing all the time. And I accept your point that as a worker in the health service, you don't always know. Um, but we have had some very positive um, social media um, action. We're very we're quite prolific on, on um, Twitter ourselves. Um, so uh, it's about raising that. It's about that visibility, I think, which, um, which we accept may not have been quite so clear in the past. I, I think one thing that we've um, done differently, which is, has been a, a, quite a, a development for us, has been um, the what's called the Voices Scotland uh, mm. approach. So that's about us... Uh, building capacity with community groups who might have an interest in getting and inv getting more involved to try and sort of broaden the, the reach and diversity of people who are getting involved um, at local level. Um, so it's a it's a quite a flexible sort of modular approach. It was developed by Chest Heartstroke Scotland. Um, so it's about working with groups. Uh, to, to um, support and enable them to have an understanding about how their, their local services are structured, how they work, to encourage people to think a bit about their own experiences of services, what matters to them, um, what, what might be the things that they might like to see change in their services, um, and how might they go about having their voices heard locally. So that's that's been quite a new development for us, but our local staff are all um, trained in the, the delivery of this approach and have been using it quite flexibly in terms of working with different groups. And I suppose that's that's partly about trying to encourage some some sort of bottom up um, engagement from communities for it to be about you know encouraging bodies to respond to the issues that matter to people rather than to be um, consulting about the issues that that they want to consult with people about mm. um, so it's, it's about trying to encourage that that confidence within communities okay. so it's, it's it's still a relatively new piece of our work but um, it's been pretty positively received by the, the groups that we have worked with. Well, it takes a long time to um, push change forward in the National Health Service or as, you know, because it's very slow and people have to join together. But I'm also interested, how do you decide how to go out and do consultations? The organ transplantation and tissue donation, there's no input from anybody in NHS and Fries and Galloway or the borders but we've got input from Ayrshire and Arran. So South Scotland's a huge region, so how do you decide who to go and engage with locally? Yeah, so, so that's our, what, what we call our gathering views work, um, and that's usually in response to requests, um, sometimes from Scottish Government, sometimes from, from other bodies. Um, I think the, the um, advantage for us is that we've got a sort of national presence with a local reach, so we're able to... Um, with the contacts and experience that we have within communities, engage um, in quite a targeted way sometimes with, with people. Um, so it's about having conversations with the people who, who are asking us to, to do that work on their behalf. Um, in the case of organ um, and tissue donation and transplantation, there had already been other work and other engagement planned, but I think there had been a need identified to engage with particular groups. So that was people with um, learning difficulties um, and looked after children and young people. And that's because when it comes to issues around um, transplantation, tissue donation it's it, there are particular legal issues around consent for those groups so so that was intended to be a very targeted piece of of activity uh, so we worked with um, Bernardo's Scotland people first Aaron youth foundations and others to to design um, a, a session which would enable us to to get the views of people with learning difficulties and looked after children and young people to make sure that they're voices are being heard on these really important national policy issues. But how we um, target that engagement depends very much on you know, wh wh what the ask is, wh who is the target audience, who is it people are looking to reach, and who might we work with and collaborate with at local level to enable that to happen. Does that, does that help clarify? Sure. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, briefly, Kate Forbes. Two really brief questions. The first one is, in a word, do you think that boards are engaging better or worse um, with the public? I'm not sure it's a, a binary answer. I think there is good practice around the country in demonstration of good practice of engagement, but there are also examples of pretty poor practice. And I think what we need to be doing within Health Improvement Scotland, Scottish Health Council in particular, is bringing to the surface that really good practice and have equally the transparency about where poor practice is happening. And I think that's when we'll get to a much higher quality level of engagement across the country. Great, thanks very much. And then just secondly, um, and if you could identify a specific example, that'd be useful too. I note that um, boards are in 2016-17 are largely focused on feedback, comments, concerns and complaints when it comes to their engagement, which is very much retrospective. Could you give a, an example of a board that's done a good job um, in terms of engaging with the public in a way that's bigger and broader than just reports, complaints? complaints? So we, we did some work specifically around um, feedback and complaints using our participation standards which was a, so it's about going out and looking at how how our boards responding and there was a bit of a mixed mixed picture um, around that. Um, you're looking for a can I just clarify you're looking for an example which is about broader engagement? Are you have I mean in terms of so I'm trying to keep it quick um, but in terms of how you are identifying generally when it comes to your reports how boards are engaging with the public and whether they're meeting the three um, participation standards I note that in 1617 you were largely focused on complaints etc cetera, etc cetera. are you also looking at the other standards in the participation standards and was there a particular board that stood out in terms of how it was doing that so so we only looked in, in terms of the participation standard we only looked during this recent assessment at how they were handling complaints and, and feedback um, and that was on the basis of a of um expectations within the Patients' Rights Act a number of years ago, which was about looking um, at complaints and feedback in a much more holistic way, not treating them as separate things, looking at all of the intelligence, making sure there's lots of different opportunities for people uh, to, to give feedback, things like care opinion, for example, making sure people have access to the patient advice and support service. So the participation standard assessment that we did was focused very specifically on that area of, of board's responsibilities. Um, the, the process this year showed that um, boards some boards had, had made real improvements since the, the, the previous time that, that we had, had looked at this a couple of years ago, um, others less so. Um, so there's a, a national overview report which sets out um, our findings around that and also pulls out examples of, of good practice from a number of, of different boards around it. But it's a really important area for, for patients um, and carers as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's been a very full session uh, in, in a short, compressed period of time. So we're very grateful and we will uh, uh, now adjourn the session. Thank our witnesses very much and we'll adjourn for five minutes. Um, we'll resume just at 11 o'clock the next session.
Colleagues, welcome, and uh, we, we will now resume the second item on our agenda is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's revised national outcomes. I'm delighted to welcome uh, to, the com uh, to the committee today Shona Robson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Alison Taylor, the Head of Integration, uh, and Roger Haldy, the Chief Statistician at the Scottish Government, uh, Jerry McLaughlin, the Chief Executive of NHS Health Scotland, and also Professor Sir Harry Burns, Professor of Global Public Health at the University of Strathclyde, and I understand just a few moments ago a grandfather. So, <laughs> congratulations it's as well as well. <laughs> On that cheery note, um, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Burns would have many cheerful things to say to us in any case, but um, I can tell that he's going to have a particularly elated session this morning. Um, but nonetheless, there are some serious questions to ask, and I would like to start, if I may, uh, with Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, I'd like to ask the witnesses um, how the national performance framework will address health inequalities, obviously an, an area of some concern in Scotland. Well, uh, maybe if I, I could kick off in broad terms. Um, obviously, the, the national performance framework is designed to uh, enable us to see how Scotland is performing against a, a range of indicators relevant to health inequalities and, and to make sure that it informs policy making going forward to, to tackle um, health inequalities. And wherever possible indicators will be broken down by both protected qualities characteristics and area-based inequalities. Um, and as part of the transformation of the Scotland Performance website, we're going to report on progress for both these uh, equality aspects. Obviously, reducing inequalities, as I'm sure you're aware, is already a key feature of, of much of, of the government's um, uh, policy programme. In smoking, for example, we set targets for health boards to reduce smoking in our least well-off communities as a priority, and that's uh, led to greater levels of success in, in targeting those services um, and the proportion of people successfully quitting from more deprived communities is now far higher than uh, now than anywhere else. Obviously, today with minimum unit pricing, again there's a stark social gradient to alcohol-related harm, and uh, the minimum unit pricing policy will deliver greater benefits to lower income <laughs> communities where uh, health harms are disproportionately experienced. Um, so. Um, also probably worth just mentioning, uh, we are also investing heavily in, the, in mitigating the impacts of welfare reform and austerity with a £100 million per annum uh, spend in that area. Um, I think we let Roger come in as well, but it's probably worth noting that across um, the whole of government, it's not just my portfolio that's important in reducing health inequalities, and it can't just be done by the NHS or indeed integrated partnerships, it has to be done across the whole of government and that provides the opportunity, I think, to for, for all of the whole of cabinet and the whole of government to focus. I, I very much appreciate that point because a government letter in response to the committee's 2014 inquiry on health inequalities did state that, that tackling health inequalities isn't a matter for the NHS alone. And I would just be very grateful if um, witnesses per Caps, you know, touching on that health inequalities being addressed by all portfolios, could you give a couple of examples of how you think that might be demonstrated? Well, I, th I think the welfare reform um, and the 100 million uh, investment per annum is clearly about um, household incomes, supporting people, um, and you know, it is clearly a, a, a tool. Um, in terms of tackling uh, inequality. Likewise, in, in education, the, the uh, attainment fund, again, you know, with, with having that resource for uh, head teachers to be able um, to support children uh, within schools, particularly more deprived communities. So, I mean, there, there, are, there will be examples across all portfolios. I guess where the national performance framework is important is being able to um, take an overview of that and to ensure that um, as we can kind of measure the Scotland's performance against uh, th those indicators that we're taking a, a cross-government approach to that. 
Roger, I don't know if you have to... Yeah, I mean, I don't have uh, too much to, to add to that. I suppose this is uh, uh, a framework that uh, very much is looking at how we improve the economic, social and environmental um, well-being of, of people in Scotland, and that's why we've got the, the purpose and values and, and set of outcomes that, uh, that sets that out. And I think uh, fundamental to, to this is that approach which mainstreams equalities uh, throughout... Uh, so this time we've moved from having a situation where we have a specific outcome uh, on uh, reducing inequalities to this being now uh, something that's done throughout the framework and we're reporting progress, as the Cabinet Secretary said, uh, on uh, f for different equality groups and for area-based inequalities and using that information to tell whether we're making progress for the whole of Scotland and for the different communities within Scotland. Thank you. I could pick up on, on a, a, an example that I, I think demonstrates um, uh, the point that, that you're, you're raising. Um, so um, some work was done a couple of years ago around the development of a place standard for local communities, um, which looks at a range of those outcomes and indicators that are spread in terms of responsibility across public services and looks to create, um, particularly um, as we... Um, as we have regeneration within communities or new communities being established, the kinds of conditions um, which will um, uh, um, both improve and indeed create health and well-being. Uh, at the heart of that is um, the use of a tool that engages uh, uh, local communities about what's important to them. And clearly they do not define that within the context of government portfolios or indeed the responsibilities of individual um, uh, 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 agencies. Uh, so from a, a public health point of view, um, the extent to which we can influence local community planning um, uh, uh, in discharging its new responsibilities under the Community Empowerment Act, uh, I think uh, gives an example of how we draw then right across those different national uh, outcomes. Thank you. Harry Burns. Uh, as I look down the list of indicators and so on, every single section has things that will contribute to narrowing inequality um, you know from the economic uh, one about productivity and jobs and so on to things like poverty and this kind of thing for me the critical part of this and I've spoken to this committee before about complex system change the important bit of this is about how action is going to be taken forward who's going to be doing things what do we want to change by how much by when and our experience with things like the Early Years Collaborative and the Patient Safety Programme tells us that the best people to design that action are frontline staff. It's not something that is easily done in offices a long way away from the communities that we're trying to help. So you could easily imagine a local authority sitting down, taking some of these indicators and saying, yeah, we're going to try and work to change the following five things. What do we want to change by how much, by when, and by what method? And once that gets going, we'll see change happening. So do you feel there's a bit of work to do there then? Well, uh, uh, I, there is, under next steps in the, the document, um, testing new approaches around delivery of the outcomes, focusing initially on four outcome areas to identify methods to turn broad outcomes intention into concrete policy options and proposed actions. I think I know what that means, um, but, you know, there is clearly a plan and it's got to get rolling and it's got to be scaled up as quickly as possible to have a significant impact across Scotland as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you. Kavir, can I build on Alison Johnson's points about health inequalities? I was reading quite an interesting article in Evidence from Pickett and Wilkinson in 2009 that said why more equal societies do better. And basically the argument was that we need more emphasis in social economic factors, you know, why is it the poor die younger than the rich? So basically what it's arguing about is having a fundamental change in society in the macro level to change the power uh, distribution. That's obviously a wider point than this committee, but just wondered if uh, any of the panel wished to comment, particularly perhaps Professor Shahari Burns initially. Pickett and Wilkinson's um, 
Apple theory is based around what Sir Michael Marmot talks about, about a status syndrome, that inequality per se makes people at the lower end of that scale feel bad about themselves. It's actually more complicated than that, and I've had a number of discussions with Richard Wilkinson about this kind of thing. It's entirely possible to narrow inequalities using a whole range of approaches, but the fundamental one is to give people a sense of being in control of their lives. If you're living in bad housing, if you don't have a job, if you don't have a sense of purpose in life, if you're worried about drug pushers getting at your children and so on, you are buffeted by circumstances and if you yourself have had a difficult childhood, then your ability to feel in control is impaired. Now, there's lots of evidence that the way public sector interacts with people can either enhance their ability to be in control or can damage it. And I've been arguing for a while about changing the way in which public sector interacts with people living at the lower end of the social scale, to enhance their sense of self-efficacy, to enhance their sense of control. And lots of evidence that that improves educational performance in children in those families, it reduces risk of offending, it re in increases the risk of their, their chances of educational uh, success and so on, and increases their chances of ultimately participating in economic growth. So. We do ourselves a lot of disservice by reducing complex problems to a single cause and effect relationship. It's much more complex than that, and we, we, we need to adopt these complex system approaches in order to be successful. And at the end of the day, if you get change, you might never know what it was you did that produced that change. It might be 10 of the 20 things you tried that produced that change, but my argument is who cares as long as we make things better? Thank you. Could perhaps have one final one to perhaps the cabinet secretary. Obviously, um, we've had unanimous decision about MUP, um, which I think is to be welcomed. Um, what are the next steps for that? Because clearly we all know the damaging effects of alcohol. There's some suggestions, and I'm not recommending this cabinet sector, but there's some suggestions in the press that we should have health warnings on, on alcohol, a bit like we have cigarettes. And also, there was a second issue, as you know, about the sp social responsibility levy, which I know has been put on hold meantime. Perhaps could you say a little bit more about the next steps for this? Because clearly, alcohol is a major issue in Scotland affecting our health. OK, ha happy to, uh, given uh, today's importance in, in taking forward uh, what I think is a hugely important public health policy. And I'm very pleased it has cross-party support. Um, You'll be aware that the framework is being refreshed. Now, we've always said that minimum unit pricing doesn't stand alone. It, it stands with a range of other measures that are being taken. And looking at um, the issue of, of advertising and, and health warnings has been part of uh, the consideration that Aileen Campbell has taken forward around uh, the, the refreshed framework. There are already some that are uh, that have the the CMO's guidelines on and drink responsibly um, messaging. I guess what uh, others are calling for is to go further than that in terms of the the warnings that would would be on the product. So I think some progress has already been made, which is to be welcomed, and we'll certainly give consideration to um, the the further calls. Some of this, of course, uh, will be I mean, these are UK producers or international producers. So there are issues there around advertising and where the the responsibility and power to change that would lie. Um, obviously, these are quite complex matters given where production uh, uh, would take place, but we are certainly looking at, at what more can be done uh, in that space. And in terms of next steps, more generally, the evaluation is going to be important in all of this and looking at the success um, of minimum unit pricing and what it will tell us um, about you know, whether we need to, to make any uh, further adjustments in the future. So that evaluation um, will start uh, straight away and will run through for the five years um, to give us a, a wealth of information at the end of that. And I think, as I've said before, really happy to keep the, the committee 
informed about that because it won't just be we start here and we end there there'll be information flowing through the course of that evaluation very happy to keep the committee mm. informed anything about the social responsibility levy well i think as we've discussed um, before we um have taken i mean the social responsibility was designed to be a, a local mechanism to um recognize um perhaps demands on local resources um it was never really thought of as a, a kind of national tool um it, to be in response to, to policy like minimum unit pricing. But as ever, whether it's a social responsibility levy or the public health supplement, we will keep these matters under review. We felt it, you know, it wasn't the, the right time, um, uh, given some of the, the um, economic circumstances that we've um, the country has faced over uh, recent times to um, apply the, the public health supplement. Again, obviously, we have done so in the past. But we'll keep these matters under review. I encourage colleagues to keep questions and answers in the context of the, the national outcomes, if, if we may. Uh, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to officials. And con congratulations to Harry on your new arrival. Um, I'd like to draw the questioning uh, to the content of the indicators, what's included and, more importantly, what's not included. Um, William Valentine is 96 years old. He's my constituent. Um, his son and daughter came to see me yesterday because uh, William was admitted to hospital at Christmas. Um, he's in the Western General. And in February, at the start of February, he was declared fit to go home. Um, it was a, a social care package was drawn up. It wasn't a complex package. It was three visits a day he requires. Yet, nearly 100 days later, he is still in the Western General because there has been no provider willing to take up uh, that commission. Um, we know that deficiencies in social care in our communities, particularly for older people, create an interruption in flow throughout the whole of the health service. It, it means that um, elective surgical operations are cancelled because there's no beds for people to be admitted to. Uh, it is partly responsible for why we have delays in A&E, because there are no beds in the wider hospital for people to be uh, put through to. So in that context, can I ask why there is no indicator within the performance framework for the provision of social care to older people as an indicator uh, to underlie the health of this outcome? Okay, well, well, first of all, um, you raise an important point about delayed discharge. And, of course, the trend has been uh, downwards, 7% 7, 7 uh, reduction over the course of the year. And that's good. However, there are local challenges. And you'll be aware that within the, within Lothian, there are particular challenges. And uh, there um, is a, a new uh, chief operating officer, starting chief officer starting within the integrated uh, authority in Edinburgh who I think brings a wealth of experience uh, from Aberdeen in terms of me mechanisms and policies <coughs> taken forward there. I guess uh, what is important to say in a general nature is that the National Performance Framework um, looks at the, the key indicators that can establish Scotland's performance. But underneath that is a wealth of work that's going on, particularly within integrated authorities. And, and integration authorities have, um, have been doing huge amounts of work around data uh, collection and uh, developing their own indicators. And of course, tackling delay is one of the key uh, indicators. Um, and as you say, it connects to making sure that we can reduce um, unscheduled care, that we can reduce um, the um, the length of stay, we can uh, uh, avoid admission to hospital in the first place. All of these things are absolutely key um, around the indicators that integration authorities use. Alison, probably you know more of the, the detail on the, yes. the work that's been done. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. Um, the National Performance Framework obviously sits across the top of, of government responsibilities. We're doing a lot of work with the integration authorities, as the Cabinet Secretary says, to support them to have a core of um, improvement measures which they share with us, which are common across the country, but to build around those a network of measures that are appropriate to local circumstance. And I would s expect to see quite a lot of variation in which measures individual partnerships used, particularly where they had obvious recognisable problems of the sort that you describe. So, for example, I know that in South Lanarkshire, there is built up around the partnership a framework, a local framework for improvement, which looks across about 100 measures. And it specifically focuses on areas where they know they need to see improvement and make progress. So we have a lot of work underway to 
um, reinforce the data that's available to partnerships so that they're using a common set and there are comparable lessons and evidence to be drawn from that. But then there is also on top of that, as you rightly reflect, the need to consider locally what the pressures are that need to be addressed. And as the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, we are supporting colleagues in the Lothian partnerships and particularly Edinburgh around the problems you describe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, you'll recall that there was a commitment given in the budget scrutiny that we would receive data regarding uh, integration joint boards by the end of uh, March, uh, and uh, that has still not arrived. I wonder if you want to comment on that. I think there is a letter drafted coming to you very soon on that, um, if I, my memory serves me right. So we'll make sure that, that you get that as soon as. OK, thank you very much. Whether it be Pardon me? Supplemental there, sorry. sorry, I just wondered whether it would be helpful just to say something um, to more in general about the indicators and why we've chosen the, the set that we have. Uh, because we could, you, you're right, we could have had hundreds of indicators, thousands of indicators. I mean, I'm in charge of statisticians around the country that are beavering away, producing mm -hmm. some great data. But we've chosen 79. In, in other countries that I've seen around the world, uh, that they have a, a, a sort of maximum of 50 indicators when they're trying to describe economic, social, and environmental progress. Um, and we did some consultation events with a couple of hundred um, experts. Uh, and that that generated literally hundreds of, of ideas, and I knew that I needed to whittle that down. And um, I've done that by uh, some, some principles, which were that uh, it was important that the indicators that we had measured progress towards each of the 11 outcomes that we had, uh, that they could tell progress across different parts of Scottish society uh, on equality groups, that the data is technically feasible, uh, and so that the, the, the underlying data of it uh, allows us to tell whether there's improvement or worsening uh, of measures, and that where, where possible, we're uh, aligning the indicators that we have here with the indicators from the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so and that helped us uh, to, to decide yeah, which of the indicators that we'd, uh, we'd go with. Thank you, Convener. Very briefly, I'm not suggesting that these indicators aren't worthy. They're, they're, they're quite worthy and um, quite exciting in some cases. However, I'm, you know, even though that process is as you describe it, I'm still not persuaded that an indicator which measures the number of visits to the outdoors is more important than the fact we have nothing in this suite of indicators which measures the health of our social care landscape, which, as we know from much research that this committee has done um, that is one of the, the main blockages to uh, a, an adequate flow through the NHS. So I, I just want to, why, why should we not think that the government has its head in the sand on social care because it doesn't have an indicator to measure provision within our communities for it? Well, but as you are well aware, um, tackling delayed discharge is a key government priority reflected in the fact that all of the integration authorities have that as a key target and it, it's local delivery that's going to deliver and is delivering the reduction in delayed discharge without that local delivery and the indicators and targets um, being applied across the integration authorities we wouldn't have got the reduction in delayed discharge sitting you know, with a, a, a you know a, an indicator in the the national performance framework, um, is not going to deliver the change locally that partnerships need to make sure that they because each area is different that they need to make sure their targets are relevant to their area, and it's through that sustained work around uh, tackling delay that has led to the reductions. If you look at the city of Glasgow and what they've managed to achieve for the size of their um, integrated authority is absolutely quite astonishing. Um, what we need, though, is for all partnerships to be doing that. And we recognise that in Lothian and Edinburgh in particular, they have particular market issues of the ability to recruit social care staff. You're well aware of those. So we need to help that partnership to overcome some of those particular issues 
But that is particular to Edinburgh and particular to Lothian, and therefore has to be shaped in that local context if it's going to be in any way successful. And that's why it, those, in, those targets bet, better sit within the integrated authorities. And, and it's working. That's why we've got a reduction in delay that we wouldn't, I don't believe, have had if we hadn't had those, that focus through the integrated authorities um, driving delay down. Sandra Hart. Yes, uh, convener, just a, a, a small um, follow-up from Alex Cole Hamilton's. Um, we've mentioned before about the framework. It's not just about the negativity. It's about improvements in people's health as well. And picking up on, on the older people it's situation, I think it's, it's actually quite a good thing that people are going to be projected to live longer. Uh, and I'm looking forward to joining them. And then I'm sure lots of us are <laughs> as well. Uh, and I think it should be celebrated that you know people are living longer, but hopefully in, in a better atmosphere, in a, in a better way as well. And I was a wee bit concerned that there was no outcome for, for older people. But I quite understand there's so many underlying issues in that respect. But I just wonder, when we're getting feedback from the various agencies, will there be an outcome for older people at the end of the day? Will it be included in the frameworks or will it be included in all the other uh, groups that, that are there as well? And there's a couple that I just wanted to pick up on. Um, people are living older, yes, but probably the worst thing for people's health mostly older people, but not just, is loneliness. So I'm assuming that the strategy for loneliness would be included in that too. Uh, another thing I wanted to pick up on was Dave Stewart's point about uh, alcohol and minimum pricing. And whilst we continually mention younger people, I mean, Alcohol Focus Scotland did, did do a, a pretty big, massive survey. And unfortunately, the most people who are targeted at the moment, uh, and hopefully minimum pricing will help in that respect, are older people who are lonely and sit at home and are drinking then as well. And there's, there's facts and figures to prove that. So will all of this be included uh, you know, in the strategy which will feed in to the National uh, Performance Framework? Yes, I mean, I guess it's like a, a pyramid. You've got the, the National Performance Framework with the, the broad indicators at the top of that, but underneath lie all of the... the the work that you've highlighted, uh, Sandra, and all of the local delivery uh, that is really where change is going uh, to happen. And again, you know, I can't emphasise enough the role of the integrated authorities because they they are the delivery mechanisms for, for change. Um, and they will take all of that, but they'll then um, craft it to be relevant to their local circumstances um, and to make sure that they're they're focusing on uh, what the, the priorities are for for their area and you know you mentioned loneliness and many of the integration authorities are focusing on reducing social isolation bringing people out of their their homes making sure that uh, that you know as we've i think we've talked at this committee before that you know that the idea that someone you know doesn't see anybody from their care worker on a, a friday through to the monday is is not something we want to see so tackling loneliness and the involvement of the third sector is really crucial in that and again you know we're encouraging uh integration authorities to very much have a, a focus on that and reducing social isolation so so yes um it is a pyramid and the work at the throughout all of that is going to, in one way or another, impact on these uh, very broad outcomes at, at the top. Mm. Ryan Riddle. Uh, thank you, Gina. Good morning to the panel. I, I think you, you're probably aware that, that, that I have a, um, a particular prevalence for looking at the pre prevention agenda. And I think we're looking at national outcomes. For me, it just what comes up is, is just the health of the nation. It's a measurement against the health of the nation. And I think we would all accept that uh, perhaps we're not doing particularly well um, in things like mental health, in, in terms of uh, uh, drinking drugs, in terms of obesity, uh, in terms of the health of our healthcare professionals, in fact, which I've got to say I think is fundamental to the delivery uh, of any national outcome. And with that in mind, I wonder whether you think that, that the national outcomes need a stronger focus on, on the prevention uh, to that, that, that create that environment that encourages better and, and, and healthy choices? Well, yes, uh, I, I think there there is a focus on on that in terms of reducing inequalities that we were talking about earlier. A lot of that is around um, prevention and um, 
whether it's in the, the field of alcohol and obviously we would see um, minimum unit pricing and all of the rest of the, the framework as being about cultural change. It's, it's about trying to, to change uh, the relationship, the, the nature of our relationship <laughs> with, with alcohol, uh, which is clearly about preventing um, alcohol misuse in the next generation, viewing alcohol in a, in a different way. I think we've made quite big strides forward in, in public health policies and smoking, for example. Um, you're right to, to highlight um, obesity, which is obviously the next uh, challenge, and you'll be aware of, of the work Aileen Campbell's been doing around trying to um, make sure that we take, a, again, an evidence-based approach and it's our public health policies that can begin to make inroads into, into that area of public health. I think also the new public health body will um, be able to help in giving a sharper focus to the prevention work, not just what's happening within the, um, the health field, but in its support for local government, for example, and being able to, to help local government and uh, other you know, local decision makers around some of the decisions they make in the public health arena. So, and work's going on a pace uh, with, with the new public health body. So I think all of that will help to you know, quite rightly focus us on the, the prevention. But I guess Harry's point is important here as well, that um, it's not just about a particular health challenge. It's also about giving people a, a chance in life and hope um, and that has to underlie what we're doing, particularly around children and young people, and making sure that we get that right. Because you know, we can. That that has to be one of the keys to um, improving um, the opportunities of the next generation, which impacts directly on their health and well-being. So that's why we we have a particular focus on on children and young people. Yeah. Rather than talk about the health of the nation, I think I prefer to talk about the well-being of the nation in a broad sense, because a healthy population will tend to be a population where you will see low crime, you'll see high participation, you'll see good social cohesion, you'll see productivity. You know, across the board, we're firing on all cylinders. And it tends to be a positive childhood, a nurturing childhood that takes young people into an environment where they learn, they participate, they behave well. I mean, I, coming through in the train today, there's an article in that free newspaper they give away talking about how young people uh, who get into trouble, their brains are wired wrongly. Now, we've known that for about 20 years. We've done studies in Glasgow that shows that that um, psychological activity differs in people who have lived in complex situations as, as children. They learn to be defensive and they, they, they have, um, emo they're emotionally labile, they're, they're executive functioning, they don't make good decisions and so on. We can see that. You know, when I talk to teachers, they nod because they see that in their classes. And it's about getting families secure, safe, and feeling that they can move forward in life uh, that will make the big change in the future. So I think this suite of indicators, there's something in this, in every single section that contributes to that. But I come back to the point that there's a huge number of these things. So how do we make them work together? How do we get... Um, local authorities, health boards, Police Scotland, education authorities and so on to be working together in order to deliver across all of these, these indicators to make the, the necessary change. I, I'm very excited by the possibility, but I'm in no doubt as to how difficult it's going to be to get this to happen. And we need a real open-minded approach to working together and testing things. And if they work, do more of them. And if they don't work, stop doing them and move on. A really good example of that cross-government approach was the recent event, um, 
looking at adverse childhood experiences. Every cabinet secretary was there at that event to listen to the the experiences of, of people, um, but also importantly to look at how they could have been prevented in the first place, but also when they occur, how to pick up and have early interventions. And they, um, it's it's a huge when you look at the impact of that on the population and the. Uh, the cases that, that, that Harry's referring to, it's it's huge. And we are absolutely taking a cross-government approach. It's not one um, cabinet secretary that can can begin to tackle that. It has to be cross-government. And that work is, is underway. And I think it's going to be very important. And so turning to that preventative uh, approach, you'll recall that one of the pillars of the government's health and social care delivery plan was about the reform of public health uh, in Scotland and uh, a, a particular relevance um, uh, to my own organisation <coughs> because we will become part of the new uh, national public health uh, organisation. But there have been some important developments as, as we uh, pursue that reform. Uh, one is um, that um, I expect within the next month um, a new suite of uh, public health priorities to be published. They have been developed uh, very much on a whole system basis right across uh, public services, but with a particularly strong focus from, from local government. And in the course of the discussions, particularly on the oversight board that's looking at these reforms, um, has been a contribution from uh, local government about the extent to which the public health voice in local communities needs to be much stronger in informing uh, uh, community planning. Uh, and a, a real plea that we position public health uh, to support community planning partnerships, because I think it's within those local communities that plans around um, uh, transport, uh, planning itself will then encourage, um, rather than just exhort people to be more active. Um, and, and I think it's a good example of that um, preventative approach um, uh, coming forward. Those priorities that are emerging are entirely aligned with the national uh, outcomes as these as these are being developed. Okay. Very brief. Brief. Just, just to follow on to that, uh, Cabinet Secretary, as you've alluded to, this is, this is not just about your portfolio. It's, it's a cross portfolio uh, issue here. So I wonder, just 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 to clarify there, that the, the other portfolios are feeding into those national outcomes and and are, 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 are implementing their policy uh, against some national outcomes within uh, health. Very, very much so. Um, I gave one example around adverse childhood events, but you know, it, it, across the whole development of the of this framework, it is a, absolutely across government, and and I think there is a there's been a, a bit of a a change of um, focus of really looking for opportunities to to, co to collaborate. So, for example, you might be aware of the work that that I'm doing with Michael Matheson in Justice around looking at the prison population and how we can uh, improve the the outcomes for uh, prisoners, particularly when they're leaving prison, to reduce the risk of reoffending. Uh, and that is about you know making sure not just that they get access to to health um, services to uh, to address issues with addiction potentially, but that there's a whole range of other uh, ways of of minimising the risk of of reoffending. So that's one example of collaboration which feeds very much into the framework. There are many many others, and I think there is a a real willingness to to look and seek out opportunities like that. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to ask how the principles espoused in the government's review of targets and indicators are going to be manifested within the national performance framework, and spe specifically the rationale around the review of targets was that NHS staff and managers had expressed frustration at the way targets were affecting their work and their priorities, leading them away from best practice. And I wanted to say, in terms of um, empowering our NHS and social care staff, how do you see that happening in the future? So when a nurse tells me that they're frustrated at the amount of form filling they're asked to do, how is this going to change their lives and actually empower them to do the job we, we want them to do within our health services? Yeah, well, we certainly want to reduce bureaucracy and paperwork generally, and I think the, the more we uh, use technology, I think, is uh, an opportunity uh, to do that and to make sure that we maximise the amount of uh, time that um, health professionals and anybody else has with working with people rather than uh, paperwork. In developing the new um, framework, I think we were 
very mindful of the need for coherence with the work that, that uh, Sir Harry's review um, has um, taken forward. Um, and the new, I think the new framework reflects that in a number of ways. It provides, um, it's providing a, an improved clarity on the aims of the system. It has more of a focus on indicators and targets. It's been shaped through engagement with a range of stakeholders and it looks across the whole system and how um, they're interconnected. Um, and we've sought to incorporate the, the findings of the review into to the work on, on the, the framework. But we also recognise that the framework will continue to evolve and that the recommendations from Sir Harry's work can be further uh, incorporated um, as we, we take that forward. There are um, a number of other pieces of work underway, so uh, looking at how we focus more on outcomes rather than necessary targets. There's work already underway around the uh, cancer waiting times. There's work looking at A&E and um, the four-hour target's important, but so is the experience of, of patients uh, across their, their whole experience of unscheduled care. Um, so, you know, we're looking at um, that um, as well. So I think there is a lot of work that's aligned to this and um, some of that will be reporting quite quite soon. I think you'll find it's very much in line with what uh, Sir Harry had recommended. So, the comments I made in the report about the, national, the pre previous national performance framework, when it, it was frustrating that the national performance indicators were really only being um, measured annually or and it, that did not seem timious enough to be able to make any change you know if things were going wrong waiting for another year to measure it wouldn't give you any decent feedback as to whether or not what you were doing was having an impact on them but the second thing was that I found that some of the process targets and indicators in health care you know waiting times four hour waiting times and so on yeah they're important, but I was hearing stories of people who were attending their local a &E department 40 or 50 times a year, and who were also calling 999 40 or 50 times a year. Now, a four-hour waiting time in a &E is not going to help that individual. There are other things going on in that person's life that need to be addressed, and that is where the, these high-level indicators come in you know this is these a lot of, what i was interested in was rather than worrying about how quickly people were getting through the system i was asking why were people going into the system in the first place and where were they going at the end of that system and the npf uh, indicators it seems to me will give the opportunity to start to manage that broader system and get change happening there that would reduce demand and improve outcomes so it fits, it fits with what I was concerned about, if you like, in the, the yeah. review. And I think when you highlighted that, the whole committee were agreeing around, you know, people should be getting treatment and care from the right professional in the right yeah. setting. Um, empowering, though, our professionals was really my point. And I think um, I've met nurses who have never met their managers and uh, you know, know a name but have never seen them. And it's, it's looking towards how our health service is going to change in the future for for different sort of systems working with, you know, there's lots of sort of speak within uh, this report around, um, you know, main change management, yeah. but actually making that happen in the health service, I don't really know from, from this how we will do that. And so I'm just interested to, it, to hear how you think that should actually happen in the future. It, I, I agree with you that where we've seen successful change in things like the early years collaborative and so on, it's been through frontline staff being empowered to make change happen. And that requires leadership from the top. It requires leaders who will come along and say, yeah, you know about this better than me, so I'm happy to let you test the change and tell me what happens. Give them permission to do things differently in the hope of finding a better way of doing it. And there are any number of examples in industry and so on of that happening and we have examples in public services in Scotland where it's happened. So to spread this, I think, is 
is the way to make change happen quickly. One of the best examples in the NHS is the patient safety programme. I mean, it has worked on that principle of you empower frontline staff. That's not a memo from a senior manager saying you need to do it. It's about empowering. So that methodology is now being used in other areas of the health service and mental health, for example, and uh, uh, primary care, um, and actually in other parts of the public service and justice, because it is very much about empowering frontline staff. And I think that drives culture change uh, as well and I mean, one, one of the examples of um, in, you know, making sure that our finances are, are spent um, uh, as well as they possibly can is the empowerment of frontline staff and, and giving um, and testing ideas around um, uh, the, the, the way that things are ordered, the way money is spent. So, for example, in Ragmore, frontline staff within wards have been making changes which they've wanted to make for quite some time, but they've been empowered to do so. And it's had a, a huge financial benefit to, to that area of, of, of the hospital because they know that processes could be improved. So as it is about listening to frontline staff, but also empowering them to make changes, whether it's on you know, what they, what, what's procured through to patient safety, through to uh, other areas uh, as well. And I think that is a, a big cultural shift. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, um, when managers feel they're going to get shouted at in the press, or dare I say it, in the parliament, for failing to make a four-hour waiting time, then it's understandable that the focus is on that rather than the big picture. So we, so we all need to understand that this is a complex change that's underway. And yeah, you may not have made your 95% target or whatever, but that might mean it's because of an awful lot of people coming in the front door and you should be managing that rather than throwing all the money and effort at the four hour waiting time. Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, yeah. mm, good morning panel, still morning. Um, I always um, enjoy talking about this stuff because this is what I did for a living before I came into politics, so it uh, very much reflects the experience I've had um, implementing these kind of systems across a range of organisations. Um, and on the positive side, I mean, it's great we talk about empowerment, it's wonderful systems thinking, absolutely correct. Um, it's clearly very important that we measure the right things, and I think there's an understanding there that you need to dig in and understand um, unintended consequences and make sure we're focused on the right stuff, and I can see that the thought process is starting to go in that direction. The thing that kind of concerns me when I, when I look at this, and I was looking at this as an organisational review and things I've done in the past, you'd be saying it's great you're measuring things, um, it's great you're having a conversation about are we measuring the right stuff, but there's clearly quite a long way to go and in terms of are the things we're measuring lined up with each other, are they measuring the things that are most important for the organisation and what we're trying to deliver and are we really living and breathing this stuff and using it to drive process improvement because I kind of get the feeling that I, I don't think you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is the national performance indicators and the last thing you think about before you go to bed is the national performance indicators. If you're doing this process <laughs> properly, that's exactly what you would do because what's on this piece of paper in front of us would be completely aligned to everything else that's important right across the organisation and every single thing that was happening in the organisation would understand the linkage from that back to what's on this piece of paper. So. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's still a ways to go in that journey, which is fine because the, 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 the more we go down that journey, the better things are going to get. Um, so I suppose the, 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 the question is, if you look at the different, what we've got there in terms of this piece of paper, the National Performance Indicators, the work that you're doing on indicators, what health boards and integration authorities are doing on the local delivery plans, all of that in a perfect world or, or in a kind of sensible world should all be joined up so that you know what they're doing here links up with that and we understand that linkage and that relationship and what they're doing on the, the health board at the local level directly impacts something on this piece of paper. How are we getting on with joining all that up so that it is all linked up? I, th I think we are. I think the so if you look at the work underway with integration authorities with the, the, the data working group, that um, work is very much aligned, I think, with the the... Um, the LDP standards that um, are um, continue to be important and are being reviewed and I, I touched on uh, some of that earlier on um, and that we really are you, your point about measuring the right things so you know, 
developing Harry's point in, in that regard, he's absolutely right. It's about why are people ending up at the, the front door of the hospital? And we're understanding that a lot more and the work that integration authorities are doing of actually explicitly saying we, we are going to reduce those unscheduled uh, um, episodes um, because we know that a lot of people that's the wrong place for them. So that's why you'll see uh, integration authorities investing in um, primary care, um, of, uh, keeping people at home, um, services that, that, that do that um, so that it delivers that outcome. Um, uh, and really, I think we're, we're seeing far more of a focus um, understanding some of the addiction issues and that's why some of the work going on um, particularly the Glasgow Royal for example where they've identified people that keep coming through that revolving door so um, dealing with that and having alternatives for them uh, is is the, the focus uh, of the work so I think we have um, understood that a lot more and that's why all of that work I think is aligned and then to the national performance framework the the success of all of that will drive the the um the indicators in the national performance framework in the right way again it's back to that pyramid all the work at the bottom of that pyramid is going to drive the indicators at the top of the in the right direction um through uh, making sure that uh, we're we are focusing on on the right things mm. I think that's a very important example that the Cabinet Secretary has given about the um, the objective to reduce occupied bed days in hospital that's set out in the delivery plan. Um, we have for a very long time, quite rightly and properly, focused on delayed discharge. But actually, if you start, everyone in local systems tells everyone this, so everybody knows this, if you start thinking about the problem at the point when someone is delayed, you are starting thinking far, far, far too late. So what we needed to do was get a much more holistic look at the whole pathway of care, the, the sort of experience that Harry is describing, and look as well at admission, look at what's happening before admission. So I think setting it out as an objective to reduce unscheduled bed occupancy while at one level, that still looks like quite a narrow definition, narrow enough that we can actually count it, which is important too. At the same time, I think it's a good signal for what's happening across the system. And then the relationship that we have with the partnerships so that they're looking at their current performance, they're establishing a good objective for them to improve, to fit into the national aim. I think that's a good balance. It's a good balance of responsibility and it also signals a good relationship between the national partners and the local partners. So I'm hopeful that we're measuring better, if you like, and in a better way than we were. Okay. Anyone else? Jerry? Yeah. Um, Being responsible for one of Scotland's public health bodies, <clears throat> it was interesting that um, now, just over five years ago, um, uh, we're responsible for uh, health improvement in Scotland at, at a national level. Um, and it was very clear that health inequalities had become um, a very um, a, a real focus uh, of uh, within the public policy uh, narrative uh, of Scotland. It was to the then national outcomes that we looked to um, almost source the authority for a change of emphasis towards focus on inequalities. It's why our organisational strategy is called A Fairer, Healthier Scotland. Um, and that gave us um, also the opportunity to then uh, look outside of the world of the NHS within which we operate for most of our business to then work with natural partners uh, and therefore it required us then to really develop a whole different approach to um, to what that partnership looked like. I, I, I mentioned earlier on, uh, and this is I think quite a good example, um, uh, something called the PLACE standard. That was a piece of work undertaken by our own organisation, Scottish Government Planning Officials and Architecture and Design Scotland. Not what you would expect to be um, natural bedfellows. It was quite specifically because bringing those people together um, on the basis of the evidence that we had looked at was more likely to create the conditions in which people can, um, uh, 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 can their health uh, can be preserved, maintained, and indeed health and well-being can, can, can be uh, supported. So I, 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 it's why I also what I said about the changes of public health give me a lot of uh, uh, cause for hope because I think um, the extent to which uh, Scottish Government has now engaged uh, in a very formal partnership with local government around how do we create a public health? I, I, you know, I, I think one of the 
disadvantages we've had in Scotland over the last 40 years or so is that public health has, in, in many cases, become quite disconnected from local government. And this is a real opportunity to put um, public health right back in the centre of the, the public sector space between the NHS and, uh, and local government. And that is largely driven by that focus on the national outcomes. Roger Haldy. Um, the only thing that I would add to this is that actually, in, sort of stepping back from this, uh, what I see is that while we've got some um, ongoing uh, challenges about uh, implementing this, uh, the national performance framework is seen internationally as uh, a, a sort of world leading, actually. And um, so sort of international commentators around the world, Professor Stiglitz kind of uh, says, that, says that, and indeed many countries have over the last few years come to Scotland, taken and adopted this approach. And yes, we're, a, we're you know, we've got some way to go, but um, we're, st we're still quite a long way ahead of other people. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. In terms of, uh, you've discussed a little bit about how you empower staff and how um, you include staff so that it is top of their um, agenda when it comes to just um, doing the, the daily work. How do you, in terms of improving the ways that they can feed back into the the implementation so talking about trial and error there'll be times where it works and there'll be lessons to be learnt as you go ahead with monitoring and reviewing um, the performance indicators how do you envisage um, professionals being able to feed into the process not just at the beginning of the indicators but also on an ongoing basis well, I think we need to, to look at what the evidence tells us works and with any change and there's a lot of change happening a lot of reform going on across uh, the public sector generally um, I think we've learned lessons that you know what you the worst thing to do is to send a memo down from on high saying you know as of next Tuesday this is how we're going to be doing because you know that doesn't create change and the better way to do it is through the improvement methodology that that the patient safety program has shown works. So you get, you know, you test the theory of, of a change in a, a particular setting with a particular group of, of staff, wherever they are, and wh whatever they're doing, and you get them to, uh, to, to, to test the method and then they see the benefits and then they become the proponents of, this is why this is a better way to do things. Um, so it's not rocket science, it's, but it works. Um, so I think it's making sure staff are um, involved in the, the um, un an understanding and talking about why, why, the, why is this change necessary? Why is it better to do something this way? And then the methodology of, methodology of, of change is about making sure that that uh, is tested properly and then they become the the kind of uh, the promoters of of doing that in a different way and if you look at 10 years down the line from the patient safety program that's how it started it started very small in one area doing something different and has now become a way of of developing delivering change across the public sector and i think from talking to uh, when i was at western general uh, some of the the folk who were involved in those early days of the patient safety program there was a lot of cynicism about, oh, we've heard this before and why is this going to be any different? And those same people were saying what a difference that made because they could see straight away the benefits to patients. Mm, yeah. um, so I, I think taking that that way of working and applying, you can apply it in any setting at all. And that, as we take reform through our public s services, we should be using that methodology as, as uh, much as possible. Mm. Can I Data drives frontline staff to make changes. Um, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's recent events that are making me think of bedtime beer. But um, th there was an initial, uh, you know, how do you raise intellect, uh, cognitive development in children? Well, one thing is make sure they all have bedtime stories. So you could write down and say we're going to have a strategy for bedtime stories. It's not going to work. But if you get frontline staff to say, OK, what can you do with parents who come to collect their children from nurseries that would enhance bedtime reading? And you ask the children the next day, did you get a bedtime story? And you log it and you do something and it goes up 
and you do more and it goes up again and staff become seized with this and bedtime beer was a classic example of this they get one nursery gave out a teddy bear to all the children and said bedtime bear needs a story before he'll go to sleep at night when he's going to sleep you take bedtime bear to mummy or daddy and get them to read your story so the child gets the story and it so small things like that that was one of the first tests of change in the early years collaborative suddenly it went up and East Ayrshire Council, it was, tweeted a picture of the an A4 sheet with the numbers going up, and everyone started thinking about it. So showing people that what they're doing works encourages them to do more of it, and you share it across the whole of Scotland, and before you know where you are, you've, you've got a result. As a brief supplementary to that, so all the indicators are obviously given equal weighting, is my understanding. But um, in terms of it um, filtering down to daily priorities for staff to meet those indicators, ultimately, there may well be rural in and urban inequalities in how they meet those indicators or those targets or those priorities. There, yeah. there shouldn't be. You know, patients are patients, whether they're rural or, or, or people are people, whether wherever they are. I mean, if you, if you want to enhance hand washing in a ward, the same principles apply no matter where you are. Um, so it, mm -hmm. the, the critical thing is that staff working in rural settings need to be involved and need to be part of it. And they certainly were. I mean, 800 people would get together every six months for the early years collaborative. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Very much. Uh, Ash Denham. Thank you, convener. Um, Jeff Huggins um, mentioned on a previous committee on this exact same subject that working towards um, developing a next stage process is how he kind of framed it. So I'm just wondering, um, what is the next step and um, when can we expect a bit more information on this outcomes-based approach? Well, the work um, is, is ongoing um, uh, as, as we speak, and um, really it's about making sure, um, going back to Ivan McKee's point, that it's all aligned and everybody can see how it's aligned, um, that the work that the integration authorities are taking forward on the ground, if you like, um, that there's a clear line of sight on how that fits with the the national performance framework and that the work that, that Harry Burns has um, set us on a, a, a track to achieve is about shifting more to outcomes. So that work is going on in a number of settings about how can we focus more on the outcomes for people, whether it's them coming through the front door of a hospital or whether it's them um, uh, receiving, uh, you've been able to... to um, remain at home, um, tackling social isolation. All of these things are hugely important, but the detail of them will be captured through the work of the integration authorities. Yeah, that's right. And there's, there's process around this as well. The Cabinet Secretary has chaired for a number of years a ministerial strategic group for health and community care, which is co-chaired with COSLA, building on that point that, that Jerry made about true cross-public sector working. Uh, it's called the MSG, and that group is receiving regular updates now on the progress that integration authorities are making around some key indicators which sit at the heart of what their local planning for improvement looks like. The way we're doing those updates is, it may not sound that novel, but it is. There's a national aspect to it, but then we also ask chief officers from individual areas to come and talk about some of the stuff that they are particularly grappling with. It's all quite new, it's all quite new off the blocks at the moment, but I think that's a good model to work with. And that will be reflected, the progress that's made will be reflected in the Integration Authority's annual reports. So there will also be a formal published mechanism. So we're building on all of that because a lot of effort and investment has gone into supporting that work on the side of improving the data, on the side of helping to improve skills in local systems. We have analysts on the ground in every partnership area. Um, but we're also learning from some specific improvement activities. Dumfries and Galloway, for instance, have been doing some very interesting work around dementia indicators. So we're learning from those individual bits of good practice as well. And that's basically um, the, the outline of our next stage of development of this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank the witnesses for their evidence uh, today? And uh, uh, we will now uh, move into private session. Thank you very much.